Hey there, and welcome to Online Worship. My name is Lindsay. I'm on staff here at FPC Morganton, and I am so glad that you're tuning in to worship with us online. I wanna let you know about some of the things that we have happening at our church. We have a ton of work that's going on around our campus right now. Our sanctuary is being painted, and it looks so good. We also have some old pine trees that were around the back parking lot and they were really overgrown and had, had gone past their lifespan. So they're coming down and we're replanting with a beautiful new row of trees. And so I took some pictures to let you see the progress. Also, our Little Free Library is up and fully stocked with books for adults and for kids. So come check it out, take a book, leave a book, and enjoy this community resource that we are so excited to share with you. Finally, I wanna let you know it's time for us to elect new church officers at FPC. So we would ask that you prayerfully consider your fellow congregation members for the Office of Elder or Deacon. You should have received an email with more information about that process and about how you can nominate folks. But if you didn't, you can email or call our church office and we will make sure that you are on our mailing list. Friends, it's good to worship with you online today. If you're new here, if you've been looking for a church or maybe you've been with us for a while and you're wanting to get more plugged into our ministries at FPC, I would love to meet you. So at the bottom of your screen, you'll find a link to our website and you can go to our homepage and find the button that says connect with us. That'll take you to an online form that you can put in your information and I will personally follow up with a text or an email and let you know how you can get more plugged in here at FPC. Friends, let's be called into worship using the words of Psalm 71. In you, O Lord, I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me and rescue me. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be to me a rock of refuge, a strong fortress to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. Rescue me, O God, from the hand of the wicked, from the grasp of the unjust and cruel. For you, O Lord, are my hope, my trust, O Lord, from my youth. Upon you I have leaned from my birth. It was you who took me from my mother's womb. My praise is continually of you. Let's pray together. God, our strong fortress, do not forsake us in youth or old age. Help us to follow your will through all our years and under all circumstances, that forever we may praise your faithfulness through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen.
Friends, our first reading for today comes from Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 through 10. Hear the word of God. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, truly I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am only a boy, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Just like God called Jeremiah to share the message of God's love to all people, the church is called to serve God through its life and mission in the world. And just like Jeremiah, all too often we make excuses and find reason after reason for why we fail to live up to God's will for our lives. But today, you and I are invited to consider how we might instead embrace God's calling on our lives. We can lean in to God's will and way and gifting that is part of God's perfect plan for your life and for mine. We can confess our sins, we can repent, and we can be forgiven today. And so we'll confess together using the prayer on your screen, followed by a brief moment of silence for your personal prayers. Church, let's pray together. God of peace, we have built walls to protect ourselves from our enemies, but those walls also shut us off from receiving your love. Break down those walls. Help us to see that the way to your heart is through reconciliation of our own hearts with our enemies. Bless them and us, that we may come to grow in love for each other and for you through Jesus Christ. And Father, we ask that you hear now the prayers that we lift to you in the silence of our hearts. Amen. The psalmist writes, My mouth will tell of your righteous acts, of your deeds of salvation all day long. Through Jesus Christ, we have been forgiven and made clean. We have been set free from our sin and called to live out our faith through God's mission in the world. Through Jesus Christ, I can declare to you with full confidence that your sins and mine are forgiven. Thanks be to God. And since we have been forgiven in Christ, let us also forgive one another. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Have you ever had trouble hearing or listening before? You know, during this pandemic, many of us have discovered what it's like to work from home on occasion. And some of us have discovered what it's like to have kids taking remote classes or even being homeschooled for a time. Now, while I enjoy the flexibility and creature comforts of my home, I've discovered that it's sometimes difficult to focus when I'm surrounded by my family's voices. As they're reading and learning, I sometimes have to take measures to intentionally focus. Currently, one of my favorite pieces of technology is the over-the-ear noise-canceling headphones. Oh, friends, what a game changer. But here's the deal. As much as I'd like to, you and I can't go through life with noise-canceling headphones on all the time. We're constantly bombarded with distractions, both good and bad, that are vying for our time and our attention. Voices cry out from all directions with varying degrees of volume and intensity and need. It's getting harder and harder to listen, and even more difficult to discern which voices are the ones most edifying. Today, we start the second sermon series of the season of Epiphany, a time when we look for and celebrate God's very real presence in our very real world. Our new sermon series is titled, Jesus Speaks. 
And it's aimed at helping us hear God's voice that shapes, directs, heals, and calls us. We'll be hanging out in Luke's gospel for the next few weeks where we'll hear the words of Jesus and discover how they speak to us today. And I hope you'll be blessed by our time together in the scriptures. Our reading today comes from Luke chapter 4, verses 14 through 21. But before we dive in, let's pray and ask God to be our teacher. And so God, come be our teacher. By the power of your Holy Spirit, open our eyes to see and our ears to hear what you would have us learn today. Having encountered the truth of the scriptures, may we never be the same. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, hear the word of God from Luke chapter 4, verses 14 through 21. Then he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, Do here also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You know, one might think that the words of Jesus would be easy to hear and to follow. However, sometimes that's just not the case. Here in our passage for today, the words of Jesus are hard to translate and even harder to understand. Jesus has just read the scroll from the prophet Isaiah. In his first public sermon, Jesus reads the words of Isaiah and claims them as his own. He declares them as his mission statement, that the Spirit of the Lord is upon him to proclaim good news to the poor, to provide sight to the blind, to set the captives free, and to declare the year of the Lord's favor. And then Jesus rolls up the scroll, hands it to the assistant, and says, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. In other words, Jesus said, The Messiah has come, and it's me. And hearing this, the people get excited. This is what they've been waiting for. It's a hometown bo boy makes good kind of story. Everyone is talking and having good things to say about Jesus. N.T. Wright suggests that people were not amazed that Jesus was such a good speaker. Instead, their amazement comes from his gracious words, that is, his message of grace. The expectations of the Messiah were rooted in the hope of freedom, that the occupying foreign power of the Roman Empire would be soundly defeated. Warren Carter writes that the people believed that the Messiah was to be no mere messenger of grace, but a political and military leader who would take on the power of Rome. You know, we really don't know what happens next. It seems a little clunky in Luke's gospel account, but somehow or another, the sermon takes a turn. Jesus seems to recognize their desire for the benefits that he'll bring to Nazareth and its people, and he has some harsh words. Doubtless, he says, you'll quote to me, Doctor, cure yourself and do here in Nazareth what you did in Capernaum. Although Luke doesn't tell us what Jesus has done in Capernaum, we can assume it's good because he's told all his readers of the wonderful reports about Jesus that are spreading throughout the region of Galilee. We find that in Luke chapter 4, verses 14 and 15. Essentially, the people in the synagogue of Nazareth seem to be demanding that Jesus perform for them too, to bless them with the miraculous, because after all, he's one of them. He's the hometown hero. Surely Nazareth would benefit from the Messiah being one of their own, right? But Jesus doesn't do that. Instead, Jesus makes some truly controversial comments. First, he says that none of the prophets were ever welcomed in their hometowns, and he doesn't anticipate Nazareth will welcome him either. Then, he points to Elijah and Elisha, two of Israel's most revered prophets, to make his case. 
In verses 25 and 26, Jesus says, But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine in all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. The problem with Sidon is it's a foreign power. They're enemies of Israel. It's a place for outsiders. In other words, Jesus is saying that of all the widows who were starving for three and a half years in Israel, the only one that God helped was an unnamed, food insecure, poor widow from Sidon. Not a hometowner, an outsider, a Gentile. Then Jesus doubles down in verse 27. He says, There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them were cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. The problem here? Well, Naaman's not only a Syrian and a leper, but also a commander in the Syrian army, a ferocious enemy of Israel. You may even remember Naaman's story from 2 Kings chapter 5. Eventually, Naaman converts to worship the one true God, but still, he's an outsider, an active enemy of Israel. Of all the lepers in Israel, the only one God helped was an enemy commander, an outsider, a Gentile. It seems Jesus is pointing the people of Nazareth to a God who helps and heals the wrong people. Jesus read the passage from Isaiah and seemingly declared only a mission of grace, not of liberation from foreign rule. And then he had the audacity to suggest this mission of grace and healing was for everyone, not just the people of Nazareth, not just for Israel, but for everyone. And then Jesus emphasizes his point by showing those who benefit most from God's grace are those outside the bounds of Israel, those in enemy territory, those with different ethnicities, those who are held in contrast to the insiders of Nazareth. I mean, can you imagine hearing Jesus say those things on that day? I mean, what gives? What about us? The people in the synagogue that day, they respond with anger and aggression. They physically remove Jesus with the intention of throwing him off a cliff. Have you ever made somebody so mad they want to toss you off a cliff? Once or twice? Okay. (laughs) So why might these church-going Nazarenes be so incensed that they are willing to murder a rabbi prophet teacher? I think it's because Jesus proclaims this expansive message of grace for everyone, then seems to exclude the people of Nazareth. Jesus proclaims the kingdom of God is coming with all its benefits, but proceeds to remind the people that it's outsiders who have received it. Blair Money points out that the people were filled with rage because Jesus proclaimed a grace that was wider and more generous than they were. She continues and says this, Ironically, Their resentment of the grace extended to others kept them from joyfully receiving the grace for themselves. Grace is more difficult to really embrace than we often assume. We're happy when the right people are forgiven, accepted, or healed, but we're not so sure that that we want those things extended to people outside our favored circles or that we want to extend that grace ourselves. How we respond to messages of liberation and justice will reveal how much we receive the word. I love that. Today, you and I are bombarded with all kinds of voices. Voices that tell us what to think about things and how to feel about people. Oftentimes, it's really easy to determine which voices people are listening to. Most of us simply repeat what we hear. You know, I can generally tell which news channel people watch in the first few minutes of a conversation with them. My Kim Court writes this, she says, It's easy to get lost and overwhelmed by all the voices around us, and especially the ones that try and shape our perspectives and our own stories, both helpful and destructive. But there's no way to avoid the inevitability that there are always going to be difficult voices around us. Those that we disagree with, those that are frustrating, those that convict us and force us to see differently. Friends, this is what the voice of God longs to do, to overwhelm all the voices around us and draw our focus on God's words, God's will, and God's ways. With all the noise around us, with all the voices that clamor for our attention, it's more critical than ever to listen intently for God's voice. 
This requires incredible intentionality and discipline. It requires reading the scriptures and letting them saturate our hearts and minds. It requires talking about them with others, meditating on them day and night, seeking ways to implement God's wisdom into our daily lives. It's a tall order, and it's not going to jibe with the other voices we may hear out there. As followers of Jesus, His words are to be what form and shape us. It takes diligence and discipline and intentional focus to hear clearly. So here are a few ways that we can attempt to hear better. Number one, read Scripture. Actually read it. Number two, pray. Make time for this every day. Number three, spend time in silence and solitude. Number four, commit to the Sabbath and worship. Number five, limit and screen what other content you're consuming. Take advantage of learning opportunities that are available to you. Make sure that you're learning as much as you can. And finally, find others you can talk with about what you're learning. These may seem overly simplistic and basic even, but I wonder how many of us who claim Christianity actually implement these disciplines into our daily walk with Christ. I think our life, our faith, our congregation, and our world would be much better off if followers of Jesus committed to discipleship, to being formed and shaped by the voice of God, and to become more and more like Jesus. Friends, as we move through this sermon series on Luke's Gospel, we'll be confronted with the words of Jesus, and my prayer for you and me is that we would truly hear them, to allow them to shape us, to direct and heal us, and to call us into deeper relationship with Him. I hope you'll join me in the journey.
At FPC Morganton, we know that God freely poured out love onto all of us by giving us His Son. In grateful response, we give back a portion of what we have been given. So let us be called into a time of offering together, friends. It is in love that Christ came to us. It is in love that the Spirit formed us into community. It is in love that God created us. Let us show our love by offering a portion of what we have been given. I invite you to give your tithes and offerings using the link that's at the bottom of your screen, or you can send them by mail to our church office. Let us pray together. God, you have come close and extended your love to each of us. You've given us special gifts to be used in the work of the church, and we pause and we thank you for these gifts. Open our eyes and our hearts to those that we meet. Help us to see their needs, to show your love, and to use your gifts that are invested in us to bring them life and hope. In the name of the one we love, Jesus Christ, amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Friends, let us pray. O oh God, in your righteousness deliver us and rescue us. Incline your ear to us and save us. O oh Lord, our hope, hear our prayer. We pray for the church across the world, for those of us who worship in safety, for those who worship in fear and secrecy, for those who proclaim your good news despite rejection. O oh Lord, our hope, hear our prayer. We pray for those who lead countries and communities, for those who seek reconciliation and division, for those who have forgotten to practice your compassion, and for those who are struggling to find a way forward. Our Lord, our hope, hear our prayer. We pray for our neighbors here in this place, for the faces we see in worship, for the faces who are not here due to illness or hardship, for the faces of those who worship from home, for the faces we see every day but whose stories we do not know. O oh Lord, our hope, hear our prayer. We pray for those who have lost their sense of home, for refugees seeking safer lives, for immigrants seeking new opportunities, for those who are no longer welcome in their own families. O oh Lord, our hope, hear our prayer. O oh God, our rock and fortress, be with all of us as we face whatever lies ahead. Strengthen us and shelter us as you have throughout our lives so we may sing your praises this day and always. These things we pray in the name of Jesus, your beloved Son, our Savior and Lord, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And so friends, as we conclude our worship today, may you hear the words of Jesus. May they become your focus, and may they form and shape you to become more and more like him each day. To that end, friend, receive God's blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May God's face shine brightly upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.